basically the agenda for today is um, why you would choose Data Vault, what it is, um, some of the fundamental building blocks uh, Data Vault. So if anyone's done a quick Google, they would have come across things like HubSync satellites. So we're going to cover those um, high level. Um, and then where Automate DB comes in and where DBT comes in to, to this whole thing. Um, and then last bit is how to get started. So um, if you're new to Data Vault, these are some of the questions you may be asking. You know, what is it? Why would I want to use it? Is it going to be effective for me? You know, is it going to cover all, all of the problems I have? Um, probably in some circumstances, why have I not used it before? You know, one of the reasons we call this demystifying data vault is because, especially in the um, DBT community from, from a lot of the um, meetups I've been to, uh, some people haven't even heard of data vault and, and are just not sure about it. So you know, we want to we want to make it, uh, we want to bring it to you guys and, and uh, help you help, you know, help raise awareness of it. Um, and the other thing as well, you may have heard about data vault is that it's, you know, it's an agile method. Um, and it can it could reduce time to delivery. So uh, that a question is, you know, how how is that going to work? And um, so yeah, there's probably hundreds more questions, but these are some of the top ones that we've seen, and some of the ones I've seen over the last few years in my experience. Um, so let's go over why why you would choose Data Vault and what problems it's trying to solve. Um, it solve it's trying to solve a lot of the modern businesses needs. So the primary thing right at the top here is data integration. So Data Vault, where it come, really comes into its own is if you're really if you're trying to integrate, excuse me, multiple source systems together into one central source of truth, um, and that could be multiple of your own source systems from maybe different uh, areas of the company, or it could even be um, maybe multiple data sets uh, from places all over the world that are related, but from different businesses. Uh, all that kind of stuff. So um, that's one of its primary uses. Uh, there's things like governance and data science and data sharing and greater data uh, landscape as well is what Data Vault looks to solve. It's not just a modeling method. And again, we'll get onto that. Um, it's designed for robust audit and data integrity and essentially doing all that whilst staying agile, building from foundations and a small starting point and building it up over time in an agile manner. So you don't, you don't try and boil the ocean. This is a, a word quite frequently used in this um, context. You don't try and boil the ocean, you start small and you deliver business value from the beginning. Um, so let's go back to kind of basics on what the definition actually is. And this is from Dan Linstead, the creator of Data Vault. Um, a system of business intelligence containing the necessary components needed to accomplish enterprise vision in data warehousing and information delivery. Now, the, the key thing there is it's, it's, it's not just a modeling approach. It is a bunch of things. It's, it's people, processes, architecture, um, business, and modeling as well. Um, and if you read the book or if you go on the Data Vault um, uh, certification course, that is one of the first things that's said. And it's important to understand. Um, and some of you who may have heard of data mesh may be thinking, oh, isn't that isn't that kind of what data mesh is trying to accomplish? You know, it's it's a very high level, you know, uh, kind of approach that includes governance and all these things. And the answer is yes. Um, and they do work quite nicely hand in hand um, and complement each other very well. Unfortunately, I'm not going to go into data mesh too much today, but it's very interesting. If anyone's uh, interested about that and how data mesh relates, it's um, there's some really nice case studies. Uh, Roche, a company I think in the in the states, um, has worked very closely with both the inventors of Data Vault and the inventors of the Data Mesh method to to come out with a fully enterprise um, compliant Data Vault and Data Mesh solution. Very cool. Um, so let's have a look at let's dive down a bit on this. So again, like I said, not only data modeling, architecture, SQL, people, processes, ways of working. Um, it's built for uh, oh, that's, the box is a bit misaligned there, but it's built for enterprise scale solutions. So, um, and like I said earlier, it's it really comes into its own and works best when you're trying to join different data sources together um, for an enterprise scale um, single view of the data. Um, 
I think I've covered some of this. So yeah, to be agile, it's really good when you want to be agile, when you have real-time feeds, when you want audit built in, governance built in, um, when you need to scale up. So, you know, you can foresee having billions or tr even trillions of uh, rows of data in the future, but you, you're starting out small, or even if you already have that amount of data, um, the method is really good for scaling. Um, and on that, on the last point, number six there, oh, well, there's seven, but yeah, six, um, automation. And the way Data Vault is uh, structured and the way the modeling uh, element of it works, and we're going to come to that soon, um, is that it's really, it really comes into its own when you automate. So you can automate a lot of the actual build, the technical side of Data Vault, and actually in um, constructing a Data Vault solution. Um, in your data warehouse, so your Snowflake or whatever, um, and that by automating the, the technical bits, your team and your company can focus more on actually de delivering business value and making sure that your solution meets the business needs rather than spending a lot of time trying to build the tables and trying to get your, your SQL working and all that kind of stuff where, yes, you need to do that. And part of any data warehouse or data lake or whatever solution um, you do need to do that, but that shouldn't ever be the primary focus. And the primary focus of Data Vault is delivering business value. Um, so that's where we're going to dive down here into a bit of the HubSync satellites. So these are the structures in Data Vault. Um, and the idea is that they're standardized structures that you can um, very easily create in SQL. And because they are standardized, you can therefore template them. And because you can template them, you can automate. And for those of you who have seen Automate DB before or know a bit about DBT, you may see where this is going. Um, and I'll give you a hint, it's, it's macros, basically. <laughs> um, uh, but we'll get into that in a second. The great thing about this is that they're, they're denormalized. Um, you can, they're compact and they're joinable. So you can um, you store your data can fit into one of these three structures. There are other structures. Um, but these are the core building blocks. The other structures in Data Vault are kind of variations on these that allow you to do specific things with specific kinds of uh, data that you're bringing in. Um, and the idea is you can kind of very easily generate this. You know, uh, all your business concepts goes into go into hubs because they're your unique, your unique business keys. All of your relationships between those concepts go into your links, and all of the historic um, data and actual descriptive data, so the actual tangible stuff like names and all that kind of thing go into your satellites and and you can pretty much make anything out of these three objects. Um, but like I said, Data Vault isn't just about modeling. So you need to make sure you do this, but with an eye on what the business actually needs. So your hubs should always be concepts that the business knows about that you that can link very easy to the business. That if someone non-technical goes in and sees a hub, they go, ah, oh, hub customer. Yeah, I know what a customer is. That's a very basic example, but you get my point. Um, so this is where Automate DB comes in. Essentially, what we do is we provide a, a bunch of macros for data vault in DBT, and that allows you to essentially just provide metadata, and we generate a hub, we generate a link, we generate all of those other structures just from your metadata, um, and that allows you to focus more on the modeling and focus more on what the business wants. You can just input the metadata and it will generate the actual tables and stuff in your database that you need to make this work. Um, so I'll get on to this. So the as you guys know, probably coming from DBT background, um, if not, then essentially DBT is where DBT excels and is the transform bit of your uh, pipeline. And because Automate DB is a package built for DBT, um, that's, it also covers those bits, but it gives you, it has also has all the features of DBT available to it. Plus it adds all the data vault specific bits, um, uh, that it needs, that you need to create and, uh, deploy your data vault. That's DBT. Um, the workflow essentially means, uh, looks like this. So you, you would hopefully do some upfront modeling. You, from that modeling, you get your metadata. So your column names and you would know what your hub columns need to be, your link columns need to be, all that kind of stuff. You take that metadata and you input it into the macro. You run DBT and out pops the, your table, hub customer, link, etc. 
So this is what a hub macro looks like. So this is where we, we're starting to see how Automate DB uh, integrates into Data Vault and how it helps you uh, deploy and develop your Data Vault. So for a hub, you just pull the hub macro. It looks like this at the bottom here. You provide the primary key, natural key, all these other columns here, uh, all this other metadata, I mean. And you've got links, which essentially do the same thing. Ah, and you put the satellite image in there, but essentially it's the same as a hub is, uh, sorry, a link is the same as a hub, um, more or less, but you have foreign keys out to the hubs that you're linking together. Um, and this is a satellite, which requires a bit more, um, a few more attributes in there, but essentially allows you to generate the satellite in the same way as you would any other the structures here. Um, this is what hub looks like. So you just provide the metadata, as you can see, so source model. Um, for those of you who know DBT, that gets converted to a ref behind the scenes, so it um, can work out the dependencies on your source data. And then you've got the primary key, natural key, and the load date timestamp and uh, record source here. So those last two, and again, um, I'm not going to go too much into detail about exactly all the intricacies of how Data Vault works, but every single table in Data Vault um, standard is to have a load date timestamp and a record source, and this helps with the auditability. So every single record in every single table, you know exactly when it was loaded and where it came from. Um, and that's one of the built-in audit and governance uh, bits of Data Vault. So that that's a whole that's a whole model. So your hub customer .sql file that you have the metadata or you have the macro call and that's it. Um, so any questions about that before I go into before I hand over to Jeremy? I appreciate that it was a very quick run through of how you know Data Vault and and Automate DB. But, um, if I gave you all the detail, we'd be here for hours. <laughs> Alex, it looks like there are a couple of questions that popped into the Zoom chat. I don't know if you yeah, want great. to take a quick look at those. Okay, yeah. And yeah, how does Automate DB work with Amazon Redshift? Yeah, so actually Redshift, um, yeah, I've got I've got a few direct messages here and I have there's some other Redshift stuff. So um, we don't actually support Redshift yet. However, we've been approached by a few people now um, to contribute, um, contribute Redshift. To us, um, because they're you know in a company developing uh, a data vault on Redshift, um, and we're looking to get that contribution into the public version. So very exciting. Um, we're actually starting development shortly on that. I hope. Um, so it's coming. Yes. Uh, look, I have a few more questions. Uh... Yeah, so Snowflake, um, Snowflake originally was only the only platform um, uh, supported by uh, Ultimate DB, but we've since moved to BigQuery and Databricks, uh, Postgres, and yeah, of course we've got Snowflake as well. So we've got four at the moment, and then we're going to be moving to Redshift. There's a few other ones that we've got in the pipeline that we want to support. Um, at the moment, Postgres and Databricks are only partially supported. We've only got hub syncs and satellites. Um, but we're working on adding the rest to it as well. Uh, a few more questions here. Okay, yeah. So, question uh, from Powell. I hope I'm presenting. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's always a danger with any open source um, tool that it you know potentially could be stopped stopped um, being supported and all that kind of stuff, but um, the thing is, you know, there's, there's tons of documentation. It's very easy to understand. There's the data vault standards, which you can always look and, you know, you, you can maintain it yourself, but it's, you know, it's not something that there is a lot of overhead to do. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's the, the same danger you get with any, using any other open source, to be honest with you there. But I can, I can assure you that, you know, we're not planning to drop it anytime soon, don't worry. <laughs> Uh, I have keys and link keys to be calculated. Yeah, um, you can provide your, so uh, by default, Automate DB does hashing for you in the staging area, but um, and you can configure it to do that. However, there's nothing to stop you using uh, catenated business keys if you want to. Um, that was a question of, can I define how hub and link keys are being calculated? For example, I don't want to use hash keys. Um, you can also override the uh, hashing um, macro, and you can do all kinds of things there to customize it how you want. It's you know fully extensible. 
yeah, could you share some resources to see what Hublink satellite looks like? Yeah, there will be a link at the end. Uh, answer a few more of those questions. There seems to be quite a lot here. So we'll have a look at them at the end. But yeah, I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Jeremy. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that sounds good. For, for folks who are, let's say, a little more expert or intermediate level in, in Data Vault, I bet there are going to be some, some really specific kind of tactical questions. And yeah. uh, if we've got time at the end, we can dig into those. Um, or maybe that's an opportunity to jump into the documentation maybe even jump into some, some GitHub issues and, and have it out. Um, yeah, if we have time, keep, I can definitely have to do that, yeah. But, but just keeping it high level, um, I really appreciated that, that overview, Alex. And I'm also appreciative of um, your flexibility this morning, everyone's flexibility. I had a, a little bit of technical difficulty getting uh, this uh, set up uh, for myself this morning. So um, Alex is gonna continue to share the slides and share the presentation while I'm here um, actually presenting from um, my phone, uh, like a, uh, you know, date. Yeah. Anyway, but it's, it's a good time. So, uh, as you, as we go along, um, yeah. let's, let's see what we, what we've got to, to present. Okay. So this is an image that should be familiar to um, anyone who spent any bit of time on our website, the DBT website has seen um, any of our you know, blog post documentation. This at a very high level is the analytics engineering workflow and DBT as a framework for supporting that workflow on top of a number of different data platforms, but all about moving from raw data, developing data models on top of it, um, built in capabilities around testing and documentation for those models to find in the same code base um, in structured data on top of those models. And then also a CI CD promotion process to deploy those models um, from development into staging into production, again, with testing, with clear auditability along the way producing these final set of data sets um, that could then feed into BI, feed into um, other workflows, ML, operational analytics, whatever the case may be. Um, now, there's a bunch of different ways to actually do this process in the middle in terms of thinking through how, how are you staging your data? How are you structuring a DBT project, a set of models, um, what, what kinds of naming conventions and just conventions around the granularity, the expectations around um, how those models are, are interrelating to each other, both over the course of the DAG, uh, building from left to, to right, and also in terms of the final um, set of models at the end and the, the structure and schema of those models. So Data Vault offers one uh, really compelling, I know for many, many folks, uh, way paradigm pattern of pursuing that modeling. And then DBT is, is here to offer a set of really like building blocks, really constructs that can support Whatever the modeling paradigm is, whatever the pattern, we think you should be building your models in a way that's modular, uh, in a way that is tested and documented throughout um, with clear definitions of sources over on the left side, instead of just accessing raw data uh, willy nilly throughout the analytics ecosystem, and with capabilities around things like exposures over on the far right side, so that there's a lot of uh, uh, explicit denotation when a final model, a final data set is being accessed downstream in other systems. So again, however you are pursuing that pattern in the middle and lots of different folks have lots of, lots of different ideas here, the foundational building blocks of DBT are here to support. So Alex, if you could go to the next slide here. Um, one thing that I wanted to call out that's a little bit newer is uh, our most recent release of DBT Core 1.5, which was released last month in April, um, some new capabilities around model governance. And this is taking that uh, one step further as we move toward a world where uh, multiple different uh, DBT projects can actually be worked on by multiple teams at a larger organization. So Alex was talking a little bit earlier about pa patterns like data mesh, uh, thinking about scale and supporting uh, or making sure you're pursuing a modeling pattern that's going to support your organization as it scales up its data practices. There's a whole lot of documentation, uh, as the slide shows, that's now live on docs.getdbt.com. I encourage everybody to go give this a read. Um, I had a hand in writing plenty of this. So if you have thoughts, if you have questions, there's a lot to dig into here and a lot to, more to discuss. But the really big ideas here are actually providing teams with the ability to define more explicit, more clear interfaces of which models are implementation details private methods along the way of their uh, modular building process, and then which are set guaranteed public interfaces that are ready to be shared with other teams. 
those, those hubs in a data vault paradigm that really represent the canonical version of a business entity, uh, for example, as well as some functional capabilities around defining a contract for that model, a set of guarantees about the shape and structure of its data output, and in the event that there needs to be uh, a breaking change to that structure, to the column names or types, uh, something to be removed or retyped or renamed, uh, to actually pursue that migration pathway by means of this new capability around model versions. So yeah, there's a lot more that we could get into here um, and lots more to, to read and to say, but I wanted to give that high level review of this is something that we are thinking a whole lot about uh, this year, supporting these more complex, more scaled out deployments of DBT at larger organizations. Alex, could you go to the next slide? Okay, big idea here. Every model can have an optional contract defining and guaranteeing its data shape, whether it's being shared with other teams developing in DBT or exposed, right, via some kind of exposure to other systems, uh, BI, ML, whatever the case may be. Models can have private or public access levels to just have much more intentionality around what is in a contracted guaranteed interface and then what is a private implementation detail and when a model's contract changes in a way that's backwards and compatible it's reflected with a new version. Next slide. Okay, so coming soon and in the, over the next few months, we're actually going to be extending these capabilities, these foundational building blocks um, into real support for multi-project collaboration, which looks a little bit different from how it may work today in large monolithic DBT deployments um, and in uh, deployments that require installing multiple DBT projects as packages packages, which I'll talk about in a second, totally appropriate for uh, these kind of re reusable macros or uh, patterns that want to be uh, utilities across projects. But in terms of actually facilitating collaboration between and across multiple teams, um, we believe that this is the way to do it. It is providing reference capabilities just by writing ref, but to public models explicitly contracted, defined as interfaces, in another team's project upstream. Okay, so this is very exciting stuff coming in the next couple of months that we'll have more to say about. Um, and just wanted to give a little, little pitch of what's, what's ahead. Alex, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, big idea revisited. In this paradigm, um, each project would be re responsible for serving public models with defined contracts on their guaranteed output shape versions if there's a need for breaking changes, downstream projects, reference public models, and upstream projects, it's always possible to see the unified DAG um, enabled. In this case, it's going to be enabled by metadata in DBT Cloud. Okay, next slide. All right, so I wanna say just a few words about the package ecosystem in DBT. Um, if you're, again, if you're not familiar, a package, uh, as Alex was mentioning earlier, is a way to share reusable code across projects uh, with the wider public. Um, there are lots and lots of open source packages providing utilities, uh, macros like dbt utils or um, auditability uh, aid or, or even code generation. Um, in this case, we are talking about uh, macros to help automate the data vault modeling paradigm using dbt. Okay, next up. So there's a whole bunch of packages up on the hub. Yep, that, that's great. Um, of which you know there's three featured there, but in fact there's over 250 public packages uh, on the public registry hub.getdbt.com. More than 50% of active DBT projects use packages. It is one of the most widely used, the most consistently used features in DBT. Just goes to show how important it is to the ecosystem to extend. Um, again, not just not repeating yourself within one project within one bit of your modeling code but actually solving the same problem in repeatable ways um, as, a, as a wider industry, as a set of a community of practice. Um, the, the folks at Automate DV know a whole lot about Data Vault, know about the best ways to encode that work and are providing it to the whole world uh, so that we are not reinventing the wheel over and over again. Um, so to that point, Automate DV, formerly known as DBT Vault, one of our top 20 most installed packages with hundreds of projects actively using it in production um, every single week. So it just goes to show um, how important it is as a contribution to uh, the ecosystem. Next slide, please. Okay, so the last point I just wanna make here um, is DBT Cloud in particular, we see as being 
let's say, the operating system for Data Vault for folks who want to be adopting it. Next slide. So DBT Cloud makes it easy to maintain many of the best practices of Data Vault, um, like using pre-built packages such as Automate DB, um, making it really simple to go from uh, uh, initial table-based builds to incrementally processed and reprocessed uh, builds so that you're only rebuilding data that arrives uh, that's new using Jinja and macros um, to uh, create you know, these reusable assets or uh, benefit from the fine work that Automate TV has done, as well as making it really easy for lots and lots of folks at an organization to contribute in development, um, a really straightforward and simplified Git workflow, and uh, a, a real first-class CI CD experience where it is easy to test and run just models that are changing um, at, in an increasingly large project. Finally, auditability and uh, security here, first class considerations in, in DBT Cloud, data lineage, audit logging, SSO, role-based access control, all the kinds of things that an organization looking to adopt Data Vault and scale it out uh, should, should really care about. So that is um, our take on DBT Cloud as a platform to start adopting Data Vault, um, continue scaling it out um, in a way that really manages the change management uh, much more effectively than I know some of the uh, other ways of doing this work can, can end up leading to. Next slide. Okay, there it is. Pretty much uh, more or less what I think I just got at, let's just say scalable, ad agile, and auditable data vault with DBT Cloud.